generations to come. Welcome to another edition of the TDN Writer's Room Podcast presented by Keeneland. My name is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, also co-host the Down the Stretch Radio Show on Sirius XM Radio. Hi, I'm Randy Moss. Sorry, I was asleep at the wheel there. Randy Moss with NBC Sports. Uh, glad to be back from uh, a uh, four-legged equestrian Olympic assignment and back into uh, back into the horse racing swing. So you come in here with first racing. And Randy, we're glad to have you back. But what was your favorite moment of all the equestrian days, the dancing horses, everything that you covered? <laughs> you must have one favorite moment. Other than Snoop Dogg showing up with Martha Stewart and being deathly afraid of horses, I, I think it would. I, I'm, I'm partial to the show jumping. I, I really like that sport, and I, I like the the no nonsense rules. There's no judging or anything like that, and the beauty and the athleticism of the horse. It's always very dramatic and all that. So I think the individual final of the show jumping was probably my favorite. Well, I want to hear more about Snoop Dogg. Oh yeah, well, no Snoop Snoop Dogg. I don't know how much he was making. They say he was making about a half million a day for oh, NBC. Wow. Uh, and he worked his ass off. They wow. NBC sent Snoop to every possible venue. He got in the pool with Michael Phelps and swam with Michael Phelps. Uh, he, you name it. Every single venue, Snoop Dogg shows up. And last Olympics, he and Kevin Hart famously uh, – called sort of describe dressage horse dancing right and neither one of them had ever seen it before and and they both just like it, it went viral it's on youtube snoop called it horse crip walking <laughs> and, and and they were and, and he was doing a beat while the horses were doing their dressage thing you know so uh, uh he and martha stewart came back to the venue and got a chance to meet some horses up close and personal they had their riding outfits on with their helmets and everything and it was it was really pretty comical, but Snoop did a great job for NBC. He really did. It was really really fun to watch. It was it's well done and it's it's ongoing. But yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Well, I know one place Snoop Dogg was not this weekend, which was at <laughs> Colonial Downs. Uh, lots of all this crazy weather this weekend, where they had to uh, postpone the races at Colonial and run them on Sunday instead of Saturday. That the old Arlington Million races would move to Churchill and then c came to Colonial, which is a pretty good home for them, I think. That's a very nice turf course there and whatnot. So let's start with the Arlington Million, which is the big show. And going into that, Charlie Appleby was having kind of a tough weekend. Um, he was. In the four-star Davy he lost with Legend of the Time. And in the Saratoga Derby, he lost with Nation's Pride. Not used to Charlie Appleby going 0 for 2 in American Stakes races, but he more than made up for it with the win in the Arlington Million with Nation's Pride. Uh, this is a horse that William Buick came over to ride. Had run well in the Manhattan, run well in the Man of War, and kind of probably I would have to say this is one of the softer Arlington Million fields we've seen in a while. But having said that, uh, go Charlie Appleby. He does it again. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair to say it's among the softer fields. You don't get six horse fields in the Arlington Million very often. Uh, and for my money, I mean, the um, the appearance, the full time appearance of Charlie Appleby string uh, in the United States uh, this spring and summer has been one of the major stories in American horse racing. And for the most part, uh, they've lived up to the billing. I mean, there's no way that Appleby was ever going to continue the kind of percentage that he had about a year ago, right? When he was batting like 75% or something with the horses he shipped to America. Uh, but the string that he's had in New York and he had him in Kentucky for a while uh, on Kentucky Derby weekend, and now it's continued on to Colonial Downs. It's been a, uh, in my opinion, a huge addition to the American racing scene. Yeah, it, it has been huge. And to give the horses that ran in Saratoga an excuse. We're, we'll talk about the Saratoga Derby and the Four Star Dave in just a moment. But horses that come from Europe are looking for firmer ground, and you're not getting that Saratoga this weekend. So I think they just spun their wheels and just did not run their races. Nation's Pride got the the ground he wanted. It was an easy field. He ran over the top of. He got his final quarter of a mile in twenty three flat. The Allianz Million didn't run till eight o'clock last night. I mean, I hope. It, was still light out there, but eight o'clock, one of the satellites went down. They just had to push everything back. 
So it was a long day. Those horses had to endure like an awful lot with the races being pushed back. But he was much the best. Was it the best field I've ever seen? For the million? No. And you know what's killing the Arlington million? It's Kentucky Downs. Kentucky Downs is going to kill turf racing in August because they're just offering up so much money. I yeah, mean, it's a good, good you point. Can't compete. You cannot compete with that. So the uh, Beverly D, of course, is on that card as well. And I think this was, if you look into it, um, the race to figure out who has the best grass filly and mayor in the country, not trained by Chad Brown. Where was he? He wasn't even in here, which is something unusual. But I, 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 I've always had a, kind of a soft spot for Canadian racing. And I thought it was super cool that the 2023 uh, horse of the year from Canada, uh, Mora took, uh, excuse me, she's 2022. Mora is 2022 and Fevrover 2023 horses of the year. The two last two Canadian horses of the year were in this race. Mora, who's just a, you know, she can't win all these grade ones all the time in the U.S. She's just a tiny cut below some of the others, but she's a good, consistent mayor. She ran second in the Diana behind who else but Chad Brown. Uh, ran pretty well last year in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Turf. And if, for those of you who aren't familiar, don't pay much attention to um, Canadian racing. Um, it's not just Mark Cassie. Kevin Attard is a terrific trainer and really knows what he's doing. So he takes the uh, hardware and the uh, money back to Toronto in the Beverly D with Mora. Yeah, for my money, she's the best female turf horse in North America. Um, last year at the Breeders' Cup in the Philly Mare Turf at Santa Anita, uh, she was kind of overlooked at 13 to 1, but she was third behind in Spiral and Warm Heart. She was the best of the North American base fillies and mares there. Then she goes to the Diana and she lost to White Beam, but you can make a strong case that she was the best horse in that race. The way the race developed, and you predicted it, Bill, with mm -hmm. zero pace in the race, and White Beam was able just to, as they say, walk the dog on the front end in very soft fractions. And Moira was the one that was uh, in the second flight behind that very, very slow pace, who ran the best. And she just lost by three quarters of a length. So no surprise that she was a three to five favorite in there. She had to work really hard to beat another really talented uh, distapper in Fev Rover. But uh, Moira is really a very, very nice five-year-old mare. And you hit the nail on the head, Randy. She's five. Now, she went through the November sale and... I don't know if they were dispersing a partnership because some of the same owners yeah. are, are still in there, but she went through for $3 million. She's turning five in January. It takes a lot of balls to keep a mare in training at five who's already won um, the, the Queen's Plate, right, which is now the King's Plate. But she'd never won a grade one race. That was her first grade one race in the Beverly D. She's run strictly in stakes. She broke a maiden in a stake, but she finally picks up a grade one. So, I mean, she's going to have a bright future ahead of her. But yeah, Moira. And the best name ever. I mean, who's not a fan <laughs> of Shit's Creek? <laughs> you guys watch that? Sorry, I don't. No, I didn't. I that's I should have. I've been wanting to, but I'm, I am familiar with the namesake. Yes. It's absolutely brilliant. Now, I had to literally get pulled by my hair to watch it by Steph Brennan who told me it was absolutely brilliant. And Steph and Niall have watched the whole thing. And we stay with them during the April and March sales. And I think we watched the whole two seasons or three seasons or whatever it was. It's hysterical. It's really, yeah. really good and aptly I, named. I don't know what's a better name, though, Moira or Carl Spackler, who will get, oh, we'll get to that. In just a second. <laughs> I vote Carl Spackler. That's the name of the century. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But anyways. All right. So the third of the three races of Colonial was the Secretariat Stakes going one mile. Um, uh, Graham Motion had crossed entered Tri-Carry both in this race and the Saratoga Invitational Derby. And uh, even though the Saratoga race had a higher purse, he uh, said that he thinks Tri-Carry is uh, better as a miler and wants that to be this horse's future. The other race was at a mile and three sixteenths. He absolutely made the right decision. She wins. He wins the um Wins this race quite convincingly, and uh, now has got uh, four. Now has got some real good uh, credentials uh, coming out, av having won four of his last five races. I think they're calling them trickery now. I was saying, trickery. yeah, they they called the race trickery. 
And in the interviews, he was called Trickery. Big shout out to Bob and Sean Feld, who picked this horse up for a mere 27000 at the OBS October sale. So well done to them. Feld family finds. They pick up cheap horses along the way, and they've picked out a lot of good horses. Bob's got a good eye for a horse. He was great. Got a terrific ride by Johnny V. Delighted for Graham Motion to take down the Arlington, the Secretariat, not the Arlington Million. But he was the best in there, wasn't he? I, and he, he, in my opinion, sort of stepped into the next level, right? right. I mean, he was, a, he was a good horse already. And yeah, Graham Motion may have preferred to run in the mile in the Secretariat, but he was coming off a win in the Belmont Derby at a mile and three sixteenths. So he's versatile. He's not limited to being just a miler. And it's just unfortunate that they had to run the Saratoga Derby and the Secretariat basically on the same weekend because it would have been nice to see all these horses in the same field. I think Trickery was the best three-year-old grass horse to run last weekend. He's going to step up into like the mid-90s, maybe even 97, 98 buyer speed figure, I think, based on that win uh, at Colonial. And uh, I think, you know, he's really, really on an upward uh, swing in his career. More weather problems in New York where they had to take the two grade ones uh, scheduled for Saturday and move them to Sunday. They took everything else off the grass on Saturday. And that was, that was a good decision to make. That, that was, you know, people were thinking on their feet this weekend, both Colonial and Saratoga. Four star Dave. Uh, if I would tell you Chad Brown won the four star Dave, what, five, six times? You wouldn't. You say that probably sounds right, right? <laughs> He never won the race. How is that possible? Chad Brown was 0 for 15, uh, but no more. He gets the job done. And I'm sorry, Zoe, about Mora. Carl Spackler is maybe the greatest <laughs> name of a racehorse ever. And it's so cool. It, of course, is the Bill Murray character from, um, <laughs> from Caddyshack. We need Bill yeah. Murray to uh, pre- accept the trophy in the winter yeah, circle at, at some point. Yeah, that would be really cool. And the way this horse is running, there'll be some more uh, winter circle photos for him. Uh, this is, I think this was the best race of his career. He, he was always, for a while, he was the kind of horse that had the potential to be a real superstar in the sport, but then something would happen. He wouldn't run his key race. You know, maybe an injury here or there. He just never really... Uh, achieved the full level of his potential until like his last few races. Uh, he's now he's putting them together back to back. And I loved this particular outing. I, I agree with Zoe that uh, you can't look at Ottoman Fleet's race as representative of his usual form, because I do think even though the course was rated as good, I think looking at the times, it was closer to soft than it was to good. I think that was kind of a PR move by Naira to call it a good track instead of soft uh so i think we'll see ottoman fleet bounce back and it'll be a good matchup next time to see carl spackler against ottoman fleet on firm turf carl loved it he loved every second of that race and how about the meet dylan davis is having he's really stepped to the forefront he's winning races in bunches that's his third grade one his first ever at saratoga which made it even more special uh, owned by Carson and Wade Yost. We know that story with Carson's run. Just a terrific story all around. And how about the reemergence of Cupid? Now standing in Maryland, I'm going to give this a plug for my good friend Gary Murray and Elizabeth Voss at Atlanta Hall. Stands for 8,000, or he did this year. If you're looking at Carson's run, he's just this big, gorgeous horse. And when I first saw him, I was like, is that Cupid, really? And it just goes to show you that that he's been given a bit of a chance and he'll do really well in Maryland as a regional sire. Yeah. Very that was happy. The, that was the uh, Saratoga Derby a half hour after the four-star Dave. And, you know, those four horses hit the wire right together, right? Carson's Run, Legend of Time, another Charlie Appleby horse, Deterministic, who's now got a new home on the grass, and Royal Majesty. Um, they were all right together. A good race. I think Trickery's race was better in the secretariat, but I mean, how can you not root for a storyline like Carson's run and the Yost family and all that really, really made it extra special. Uh, the other interesting thing about the Saratoga invita- Derby Invitational is it's a win in your in race for the Cox Plate 
in Australia. And I spoke to Terry Finley earlier today, and they're very serious about going to look into that and maybe send him over there for one of the bigger races on the Australian calendar. That would be a lot of fun to see him go over there. But uh, keep your eye out for that because they uh, certainly are aware of the invitation and certainly are taking it uh, under strong consideration. All right, guys, I'm jumping all over the place. Carson's run, Carl Spackler. I don't know what's going on. It's been a really long week here at the Saratoga Sales, but I did want to mention Carl Spackler and the ownership group. Bob Edwards, E5 Racing, a really, really special win for them, a homebred for them. I mean, we keep, we're not going to have anyone buying horses at the sales. They keep breeding them. I mean, look at Klarovich breeding all his good ones now. Bob Edwards and his Avenue, Fifth Avenue Bloodstock, breeding Carl Spackler with Zendaya, the first mare he ever won with, just coming full circle at Saratoga. So really cool stories all around in Saratoga this weekend. Do want to remind you that the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland's September yearling sale internationally recognizes the source of thoroughbreds who excel in the sport's most important races, has cataloged, listen to this, 4,396 horses to be offered offered over 12 sessions from Monday, September the 9th through Saturday, September the 21st. That's a whole lot of horses. And for the fourth consecutive year, I think we finally got something right here. The format remains the same. The two-day book one will be held on September the 9th and the 10th. And the two-day book two will take place on September the 11th and the 12th. September the 13th, which is a Friday, Friday the 13th, will be a dark day, guys. And the sale will continue on Saturday. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. At Keeneland, a horse will always be measured in hands. Hands that see, that sense, that speak. Hands that hold our sport to a higher standard. Not for our sake, but for theirs. For the love of the horse. For generations to come. He's all class, this champion Moana. And he's lost on the outside here with a great turn of foot. Palace Pier, but it's Pier, Palace Pier, but it's Pier. Space Blues, Space Blues. Space Blues, Space Blues. He's danced every dance, we incredibly sound horse. After every run, he always comes back to more. He's a true Dabawi that goes out there and he gives everything. segment that you're going to have some fun with. It's news you can use with Emma Berry brought to you by Darley. She is our person that brings us up to speed on all things European racing and sales. And I, I know right now, Emma, what you're busy with, what you're studying is the Arcana August sale, which is a boutique sale with just 335 yearlings on offer. What can we expect to see if, from there in terms of quality and pedigree? Yeah, well, it's the first big European yearling sale and it's France's major major sale of the year, certainly for yearlings. So um, it is select, as you say, but it's it's also, you know, a great sort of first sort of tester, if you like, for the market here. We've all been watching on and seeing how strong things have been in Saratoga. And I guess everyone in, in Europe is now sort of hoping that uh, we'll follow suit. And, you know, this is a really international sale. Um, last year's was particularly strong. Um, there's a really, I've been interviewing consignors all week, really, and there's a really good vibe going Going into this week, we start on Friday and um, I would imagine we will expect to see again, you know, well, Godolphin and, and Coolmore always play a big part on the buying bench. But we've had, you know, in the last few years, you know, major participation from Bahrain and from Japanese buyers as well. So I'm, I'm sure we're going to be seeing more of the same, you know, looking, you know, looking out, out for some of the best pedigrees on offer in France. Well, Emma, looking at it from this side of the pond, it seems like this particular sale is getting more and more important internationally as each year passes. And with all these big sales, Keeneland, Saratoga, this one, it seems like there's always excitement about the new stallions and their first crop yearlings. What uh, On that particular topic, what do you think the sale has to offer? Well, it's going to be very interesting, as you say. I mean, this is this is the first time we'll get to see any of the yearlings by, um, by the freshmen for this year. Um, the best represented best represented in the catalogue is St. Mark's Basilica, who was a champion two-year-old. And um, 
a classic winner as well here he's by Siuni. Um, he has 12 in the sale, including several out of Group 1 winners. So I'm sure we'll be hearing his name plenty during the week. Um, there are also a couple of Dali first season sires represented. Space Blues, who remember the Breeders' Cup mile winner. He's got a handful of yearlings in the sale. And a horse who really kind of partly made his name in Deauville already as a racehorse, Palace Pier. Um, a really brilliant son of Kingman, five-time Group 1 winner over a mile. He has, again, only kind of a select group in in um, in the Deauville sale. Like, I think we'll see a lot more um, at Newmarket, in, you know, once we get to Tattersall's for the October sale. But, um, yeah, we've got a, a decent bunch to start out with. And um, Palace Pier himself won the Jet de Marois, two, two years running, actually. That was last weekend in Deauville. Um, and, you know, the sale obviously runs concurrently with really top-class racing just across the road. On the race course, so we've got uh, we've got that to look forward to, as well as um, you know some of some hopefully explosive action in the sales ring. Do, do you know of any particular horses thus far that we could zone in on? We're just watching from afar, so I, I like to write down horses and watch them go through the ring. Do you have any insight? Um, yes. Well, funny enough, every every consigner I've spoken to. So far, well, at least several of them said to me, I've got a lovely Blue Point filly. And of course, we've been hearing quite a lot about Blue Point. He's a sire of Rosalian, who sadly was missing from, from Goodwood, but is already a classic winner this year. And Big Evs, who I know you love, Zoe. Uh, Big Evs yes. came back out and again at Goodwood. He's going to the Nunthorpe hopefully next week. Um, and Blue Point, so he's now got his, this, this effect would be his third crop of yearlings. And he's a sire that's really taking hold here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if if we see you know, some good results for him. And of course, Dubawi, one of the kings of Europe. Um, there's only five in the in the catalogue, actually. But there's a full brother to Group 1 winner, um, Ancient Wisdom, who's uh, co-bred by LNJ Foxwoods with um, with Monso. I wouldn't, uh, he, um, I think Ancient Wisdom was about 2 million when he sold here. And um, yeah, this, uh, are the full brothers in the, in the catalogue. And we've also got a full brother now have I got it the right way around yes a full brother to last year's top lot which was um a Dubawi filly who was herself a half sister to two group one winners Wooded and Buccaneiro Fuerte so I wouldn't be surprised if again her brother um makes a bit of a splash Emma every job has its downside what did you do to deserve to have to spend two weeks in Deauville every year and uh is there going to be a little something extra in your paycheck because of this uh <laughs> this terrible assignment well, I'm pretty sure I can rely on Sue Finley to take us out for some nice <laughs> dinners uh, while we're there. Yeah, it's a tough gig, you know, it's it's a hard beat. But we, yeah, as I say, we get to see some really good racing while we're there. The beach isn't too far away. There's a great market. And Dover is just a beautiful town. So I'll sneak out here and there and, and make the most of, uh, of a lovely few weeks away. Very good. Emma, thanks as always for filling us in on news you can use. Pleasure. We'll talk to you again soon. Will do. Bye-bye. So it's that time of the podcast again for our Green Group Guest of the Week, brought to you by the Green Group, a tax consulting and advisory firm that specializes in the thoroughbred industry. And this is the Green Group Guest of the Week segment, and we welcome in Phil Bauer, one of the hottest trainers in Saratoga. A lot of good things happening with him and Richard Brigney in their partnership. And Phil, as I look down at your numbers, um, you guys have been doing well for quite some time. But in the last two years, this thing has just exploded. In 19, excuse me, in 2023, you won with 26% of your starters. And in 2024, you won with 23% of your starters so far. What's going right? It was... Um... I think it was about five years ago, Richard signed on, um, joined forces with John Moynihan um, in the yearling selection process for us. And, you know, we started in 2013, Richard and myself, just um, trying to do things ourselves. And um, there's no doubt about it. It takes particular athletes that to, to compete at the top level. And, um, you know, we, we uh, we were able to pick up you know a random one or two, but for overall our our our, our barn was just lacking talent, and um, so once John came aboard, it was just like a flip of a light switch. And you could tell as the horses came in and the years were progressing, you just felt like it was this giant wave heading towards the shore, and and we felt it coming, and we were excited. But I don't think you can ever prepare yourself for for the success that we've had in the last few years based on the way we started. So we, there's a lot of pinch me moments that, that were, you know, we catch ourselves and, 
a lot of times, you know, it's, I guess what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So the early years may have kind of prepared us for, for, um, you know, the moments that, that don't go so well. So it's overall, you know, Richard, he's just, he's great. And, um, the position I'm in is just, you couldn't, uh, couldn't make it up. So I'm, I'm truly blessed and very fortunate. And then to have everything coming together now with, with the caliber of horses that we're able to participate with, it, it just makes all the difference. Well, Phil, you mentioned what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, something almost did kill you. And we'll get to the horses in just a moment. Um, I, I hate to do this to you, but can you explain to us about that horrific plane crash you endured and you had the best year of your life the year before? Was it almost like your life flashed before your eyes? You know, I, I think it, it's not necessarily, I don't know, I mean, as far as life in general, I think it's the, the important things in your life. I, I uh, I was with um, my wife, Ashley Richard, and Tammy took us, John and his wife, and was, uh, another close couple to them, um, and then their their daughter, Madison, to um, Lizard Island in Australia for just an amazing vacation of scuba diving and whatnot. So we were um, on our way home, and you have to take a um, like a 15 passenger single engine prop plane from the island back to the mainland. And, uh, we took off, everything seemed normal. And about five minutes into the flight, the pilot just did an absolute 180. I mean, to where you almost, when you fly, you just get to a point where you stop paying attention. And when he did that move, it kind of woke you up a little bit, like what's going on here. And you didn't, you, you couldn't feel anything was wrong, but, um, um, one of the, one of the people that went on the trip, Eric, um, he was sitting in front. So he, there's no separation from the cockpit. So he could see all the panels and he, um, he didn't tell us at the time, but it was registering that the engine was on fire and everything was flashing. And, um, somebody in the back said, what's going on? He said, you don't want to know in a joking manner. So there was no panic. And we, we got back to the island and approached the runway and um, overshot the runway. And the pilot, and you know, after everything was done, intentionally buried it. Um, he had no, he had cut the uh, the power to the engine because he couldn't slow the engine down. So it was, um, luckily it was sand and bushes as opposed to some trees or whatnot. There was about 300 yards from the end of the runway to back into a cliff into the ocean so i think the pilot recognized he, he needed to figure out the best way and when he couldn't land uh he just told us to brace for impact and um back to your question about life flashing before your eyes it was you know you 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 know you're not ready to go and so your kids and you know all that stuff i think you know that that's what kind of went through my mind that this is it and um, you're never going to see him again, stuff like that. So it was, um, you know, something you just count your blessings and you don't try not to sweat the small stuff anymore and realize just how precious life is and count your blessings every day for sure. Yeah, it's a real thing. It really makes you think when something like that happens. Have you, when you landed on, terra firma were you like okay well i'm gonna maybe do this differently or that differently or is it just business as usual you know i think originally you, you're gonna you know you, you you kind of bulk up a little bit i'm gonna do this and this and this but life <laughs> life just kind of runs back into normalcy and i think that's some of the most comforting things is that it, you're just living life normal again and um yeah just truly, truly fortunate to, I guess, be alive. But you, I think the the great moments and the things in your life, you, you recognize maybe even more so. Well, that's a harrowing story, Phil. I'm so glad it came out uh, to be a good story at the end and everything, everybody was safe. Um, lots of things are happening for you recently. Matter of fact, you have your uh, rising star at this year at Saratoga meet in Too Sharp. Tell us about this horse. She was a horse. Uh, it was it's a fun fun story with the purchase. We um, 
we're shopping the September sale and um, the day she was going to go through the ring, we had a, in a homebred sired Indiana Philly that was running in a stake at, at um, I guess Horseshoe Indianapolis is what it's called now. So we left and Richard was going to buy her online and driving up there, we lost service. So, you know, he panicked and called and got, got on the phone with, with one of the bidders and, I'm driving and, and he, you know, we had a budget and he just kept bidding back and bidding back and it blew past the budget. And I mean, you saw the purchase price of her. She's close to a million. And that at the time was one of the, I think the highest priced yearling we had ever bought. So maybe almost drove off the road as he kept going, mm-hmm. but you know, yeah, we loved her um, at the sales and, and um, we ran into a, situation at two that you know she was just the physical that wasn't ready so we we slowed down on her and then she was pointed towards the keeneland meet and ran into a really bad leg infection and so we had to send her to the clinic and it was one of those that you know you we caught it in time but we we were concerned that would she come back as good as she left and and she did so her gate breeze uh, before her first start was so impressive that we went ahead and gave her a run at Churchill, but she just wasn't polished and kind of fell asleep in the gate a little bit with everything going around her and missed the break, but but ran well enough that you knew her training and then the way she ran that, that she's she's pretty talented. So brought her up here, got her used to the track and went ahead and took her back to the gate one more time just to make sure, hey, we know what we're doing and she worked a bullet that day, and so we were we were we were really excited to lead her over there that day, but certainly didn't anticipate her just clicking away like that. So, um, I think we're pointed towards the priors with her. It's there's an A other than the same day that we can use if um, we decide she's not up to it, but she's very very talented, and hopefully one that'll just continue to thrive on. Your other accomplishment of this uh, meet is that you won your first ever Saratoga Stakes race, the Galloway Stakes. Tell us more about that. You know, that was um, Mother Nature helped us out with that a little bit. We, we played the MTO card and uh, it worked out for us. And I was glad, really happy for the Philly. She's just talented from the word go last year or two. And then just has had to butt heads with some pretty good ones here recently and so it's nice when you can finally give them a little bit of a class break, even though she, the trip made her work for it. And I read, gave her just a beautiful ride. So that, that if we're going to win races, I'd rather win them like uh, two sharp did, but it's, it was um, just well, hard on the heart. I guess you can say from just, I, I didn't think she was going to find room. And then the way she exploded up the rail and got, got there in time was a, a good way to win our first black type race up here. And, you know, hopefully one first of many. Well, I think you're underselling too sharp because she's an absolute beast. We're privy enough to watch her with XBTV and, and get her videos. She's terrific. Helena's forte. Now that's the correct pronunciation because we've heard it many different ways, right, Phil? Yes. I think some people call it fort, but uh, from what, when we named her, it was intended to be forte. And, and I think it, the word comes from Italian that was actually for for forte, fuerte or something. So definitely stresses the E at the end of it. And that's uh, that's how she's named. You mentioned about Ortiz and the ride. I mean, is Ortiz just a master? Because she was supposed to win that race. It was rained off, four horse field. She fell on her face. I mean, that was a hell of a ride, wasn't it? He's a magician. You know, it's. It was fun for me. Um, he breezed a horse for us the following morning, and, you know, we were revisiting it. And it was fun to hear after watching the replay and the head on and all that stuff, what he was thinking down the lane. And uh, he said the key moment was when Tyler pulled the, the stick to the left hand is when he, he, he decided he's going to dive for the rail, knowing the horse would probably drift towards the other one. And it's, he's, um, you know, he's one of the hardest workers that I've, I've seen, you know, and I think all his success, him and his brother, both it, it's well earned, it, you know, they just don't show up in, in the afternoons and get on fast horses. They, they put the time in as, as a lot of jockeys do, but usually, um, 
you know, in certain s- circumstances, people at the top tend to just um, kind of go on idle as far as putting in the work in the mornings, but they don't. Phil, the Bauer Rigney team is still at it at the sales. You guys went for a seven figure horse at Phasic Tipton, Saratoga. Is that a sign of more to come? I mean, are you guys ready to now kind of play in the big, big leagues rather than just maybe the big leagues? I think, you know, that's always the goal. Um, we're very excited about the kind of, I think the last piece of the puzzle for us is the breeding. So mm-hmm. Richard keeps all his mares with um, Denali and the, the, the stock that, we've had at the track and been successful with have now kind of trickled into the, the, the broodmare band. So, you know, we've got some foals on the ground this year out of some really, really nice race mares that you're just imp- impatiently waiting to, to bring them to market because I think that'll be the final piece of the puzzle for the, mm-hmm. the Rigney racing as a whole, you know, played hard. She had a gun runner, um, She's in full to gun runner. Mariah's princess was a very talented filly that probably never showed her true potential. She's got a not this time on the ground. So, you know, you got stallion power with, with racing pages that that seems to be the key at these sales. If you bring the physical, if they look like their moms, they're going to bring the physicals and then you got the stallion power and then the race on the page. So we're excited. Is the plan to keep the fillies? and sell the boys or are you just keeping everything for Rigney racing as far as the, the breeding program goes? I think the breeding program, we're going to approach it the same we do yearling markets. You know, they got to have top physicals and um, it's, I think that's the key. I mean, it's obviously been the key for us, you know, extremely picky. John is sometimes he hurts your feelings when you fall in love with one. He said, no, it's not good enough. So we, um, I think we'll analyze it every year. And, um, you know, we're starting to get to the point where we're analyzing the mares themselves. If, it, if they're going to be some hard decisions made, if you're trying to keep a certain number that you're going to have to probably turn some loose, that'll be great mares for another program, but just aren't as good as some of the ones you'll have. So it's, it's good problems to have and just extremely excited for, for Richard and Tammy. And I think, Everything they've endured uh, early on and stuck with me, it's just they they deserve everything they're getting here recently. Phil, you paid your dues coming up, uh, including working for Kenny McPeak as his assistant for a long time. Uh, Kenny McPeak is certainly somebody who likes to do things a little bit differently. What did you pick up from him? You know, I think it's it, it kind of shows his program is is another example that you, you got to you got to do well with with athletes and, and the buying good horses it, you know Kenny's very good at it and um, I think it's um, I, I think the best thing for me with working for Kenny was I was um, in charge of 36 horses at, at Churchill and you know he was bouncing back and forth between the strings at, at Keeneland and Louisville so you know I had to um, kind of keep the, keep the thing in the right direction. And he put a lot of trust in me to, to do it. And I think it, it kind of helps you in the long run when you're kind of hold your hand to the fire and doesn't have somebody there to hold your hand all the time. So he gave me a tremendous opportunity and I actually met Mr. Rigney while I was there. And then uh, he approached me with a, a private training offer. So, you know, I think I've been very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. And, and, and then, just extremely lucky with, um, you know, how the chips fell for me. So, um, time with Kenny was, was good. You know, I experienced, um, the Saratoga's meet and then the, the Churchill with that string. So we, we ran in some Oaks and derbies and had a year up here. I think that we won 13 races. And so a lot of good times and, and was around some, some pretty good horses that, you're, once you're around the good types, they I think they teach you a lot. Just you um, can kind of think back sometimes in your own training of when you run across something that reminds you of the, some some horse that you've you've had previously that maybe you did something different that worked, and you know it's all kind of trial and error sometimes with horse racing. But just um, I think the key, you know, is 
the horse and I was fortunate enough to, to be around some good ones with, with, with Kenny. And then now the, when you walk our shed row, it's, it's very flattering that what's, what's behind the webbings. I mean, it's, it's some, some, some high horsepower. So very, very fortunate. So let's talk about some of the webbings. What's Kajera up to? And, and would she be joining your broodmare band? Cause I know she's like a family favorite, isn't she? Absolutely. You know, I think anything that's that's kind of had a career like hers is a definite lock to be a broodmare for us. I think, you know, um, I actually talked with Mr. Rigney about her yesterday and was just at the end of last year, I thought she was probably one of the best three year old fillies on the dirt. And um, she rattled off some really good races in a row. And I think it, it gave her the credentials that we knew, you know, if she doesn't come back at four, she's done enough. And but everything indicated to me early on this year that she would return to that form, and she just hasn't. I think we've had some bad luck with the the weather in the first race. Then um, I probably ran a short horse when she was second in the um, the Shawnee, and then just the brutal trip that she had um, in her last start was was one that you really can't can't blame her for. So we really haven't given her an opportunity to to kind of show if she's back and get a true answer so she's up here she's training forwardly to the personal ensign i talked with andrew this morning he's expecting maybe five or six in there so trip wise i think we'll be a little safer but you know you're, you're gonna butt heads with the best so we'll get a definite answer and no shame if she's just not gonna return back to her old form but everything she's shown me in the mornings has indicated that she should be able to so we're going to give her a few more runs and you know if, if it doesn't happen then no 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 fault to her she's she's one of my favorites i've been around you know she was our first trip to the breeders cup and you know just just a lot of great memories with her so very good what about buku is she in Delmar already tell us about the Delmar oaks because we're trained we're Recording this on Monday, entries aren't even out, so we're going to let you handicap it. How about that? I I, I felt <laughs> that you know she's she runs kind of the, her same race every every race, and then the last race really indicated to me at Aqueduct it was so paceless that she needs a little pace to run at, and she's a multiple Grade Two winner. Our our main goal, I think, this year is the QE two at Keeneland. We know she likes Keeneland. She's she's undefeated there. So with that in mind, I think we're just – we thought let's just swing it to grade ones this year and see if it can happen. And I think the Delmar race for us will set up uh, hopefully, you know, with, with pace and that kind of the outlook of the California horses, those horses that just ran in the prep were running the six furlong turf sprint so that – you know, you expect them to have pace. So in a perfect world, we'll get a, we'll get a pace set up and she'll come with a rally and hopefully we can win it. But, um, uh, the other thing is I felt maybe the East coast horses on numbers were a little better, but you don't know, it's kind of similar to when the Kentucky horses come up to Saratoga the first week. It's fun to kind of see who, what jurisdiction is, is, got the horsepower and you know last year i felt new york probably had the upper hand but this year kentucky horses have done very well up north so maybe that was a part of the the deal with shipping out there it's um you know maybe not uh, there's never a class break when you're when you run at that level but you're not hooking you know the the monster i don't think anybody will be um six to five or eight to five in the race. I think everybody's pretty well matched and I think it'll boil down to trip as most races do, but she shipped out Saturday to, to Mike McCarthy. He's going to take care, take care of her for us. And he said she shipped in well, her first day on the track was today. And we'll just, you know, she's, she's a fit, happy horse. And we just got to keep her that way for another five days. Well, Phil, congratulations on all your recent success. It's good to see that all the uh, accolades coming your way now and very well deserved. Thanks for joining us on the TDN Writers Room podcast this week and keep up the good work. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate you having me on and, uh, you know, 
hopefully um, our success can continue and um, play at the top level. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. And as this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, trainer Phil Bauer will receive a free one-hour tax consultation from the Green Group, including Lynn Green, where they will almost certainly be able to save Phil some money on his 2024 tax return. To find out more about how the Green Group might be able to help you as well, go to www.greenco.com. When it comes to the horse industry, tax laws are complicated and unique. That is why most people overpay on their taxes. Why not get a second opinion from the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred industry? With over 800 clients in the horse business alone, the Green Group has the expertise to save you taxes. There is a reason the most successful owners, breeders, trainers, vets, and horsemen use the Green Group as their tax advisors. We save you taxes. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with current-edge tax-saving strategies, produces positive tax-saving results for clients. Take advantage of this special offer. The Green Group will give you a complimentary and confidential review of your tax return. Contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. Rice's Room is brought to you by Stone Street Bread and Raised. Well, the Saratoga sale is in the books, and the seven Stone Street yearlings that went through brought a total of $4.83 million, an average of $690,000 each. All right, well, we mentioned we've got the Keeneland September sale coming up, so let's take a gander. Book one, we're going to kick it off with a bang. How about hip number 25? By Into Mischief, Out of Dreaming of Julia, which makes her a half-sister to one of my favorite fillies of all time, champion three-year-old filly and multiple grade one winner, Malathat, as well as grade two demoiselle winner, Julia Shining. What about the boys? We like the boys. Let's talk about hit number 64, a cult by Into Mischief, Out of Glinda the Good. Now that should sound familiar, right? Because Glinda the Good produced none other than champion two-year-old cult Good Magic, the sire of the Derby winner, Mage, and the Belmont Stakes winner, Doorknock. And the second leading first, second, and third crop sire. I think I got all that right. That's some beautiful speed right there. This week's Fastest Horse of the Week is brought to you by none other than Two Phils, one of those fast sires at Windstar Farm, who just happens to be my favorite of the young stallions at Windstar. And why not? I mean, Two Phils was a graded stakes winning two-year-old, a multiple graded stakes winning three-year-old. He ran huge on Tapita at Turfway Park and obviously ran exceptionally well on dirt also. A four-time stakes winner in all by a combined margin of 26 lengths. The first three-year-old of his crop to have three straight 100 buyer speed figures, including his two best races on dirt, the Kentucky Derby and the Ohio Derby. 105 buyers in both of those. And we all know he was the best horse in the Kentucky Derby, don't we? Two Phils stood his initial season at Windstar Farm 2024 for a fee of only $12,500. Now, the fastest horse of the week would be Nation's Pride, the winner of the Arlington Million at Colonial Downs. Nation's Pride, we've already talked about uh, his performance there for G Godolphin and trainer Charlie Appleby. Fastest horse of the week with a buyer speed figure of 103. 
Well, we talked about all the older horses that ran over the weekend. Let's take a look at the two-year-olds. Three big two-year-old races between Del Mar and Saratoga. Exactly what you would expect uh, this time of year is the big boys and big girls are starting to make their moves and getting ready for the Breeders' Cup. So let's start off with Del Mar and the Sorrento Stakes on Saturday. Zoe, I'm going to ask you this question. I, well, first of all, Nooney is the winner. Uh, heavy favorite, trained by Bob Baffert. She looked good. She didn't look spectacularly good to me. But I can't can't get over this. A horse that is by a five thousand dollar stallion, win win win, costs one point eight million at OBS March. That is a, a factor of that's thirty six hundred times the stud fee, three thousand six hundred times the stud fee. Um, have you ever recall seeing anything quite like that? And then keep going the conversation. What do you think with Nooney? <laughs> I think she's awesome. I. Did, was I underwhelmed by the performance? I was a little bit mm -hmm. underwhelmed at when I thought maybe she was lugging out just a touch around the turn. So that's beside itself. I was at the sale and um, I helped Marette Farrell at the sale and we were on her. She is just gorgeous. She had it all. She's a big, strong body, good walk, great temperament, like you could put a five-year-old on her. And she's acted just the same since she arrived at Bob's. Yes, is that a lot of money to pay 1.8 million for that? For all the reasons you mentioned, for sure. But she was a superstar at the sale, guys. No question. There were a lot of people on her. She stuck out like a sore thumb. And Ocala Stud breeds a really good horse, a really, really good horse. So yeah, she was much the best. Who did she beat? No one. Should she have won by 10? Probably. Well, you know, We'll have to see what happens Breeders' Cup time, and then she'll really have to face some good ones, won't she? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, we didn't learn a whole lot about her. I mean, she was supposed to yeah. win like she did, and she did, um, in only a four-horse field. And we see the same thing with the best pal the next day, just a four-horse field. It's really concerning because you know these owners want to point for Del Mar in some of these two-year-old races, and yet they can only get a total of eight horses uh, in their two initial Stakes races. Uh, I don't know if that's because Baffert has cornered the market to a large extent on the very best two-year-olds out there. Um, I mean, there are other guys out there that have good two-year-olds, you would think. But, yeah, that's concerning to me. But Nooney did what she was supposed to do. But we may not know. We may not really find out about exactly how good Nooney is, like you said, until we get to the Breeders' Cup and you get some of the best in the East thrown into the mix. The following day at Del Mar, the best pal was for two-year-old males. Wesley Ward actually did something pretty interesting. Uh, White Sands is a filly, was entered in the Sorrento. He decided, I guess maybe he was afraid of Nooney, decided to run the horse against the boys. Um, it didn't work out. Uh, she was not the winner. Bob, who else? Bob Baffert, getaway car. Um Cost seven hundred thousand dollars. His son of Curlin was fine. I, you know, I just uh, I think everything that Randy just said I would repeat. You know, we don't know how good these horses are, and we'll see. This was the eleventh time that Baffert has won the Best Pal. He's won the Sorrento only eight times. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's just total domination on the West Coast with all the Baffert two year olds. And yeah, as we sit here in you know on August the twelfth, as we're taping this. Uh, the reality of the situation almost certainly is that Bob probably has two or three or four or five in the barn that are even better than getaway car. Who knows? And getaway car is, you know, pretty solid. I mean, he's, he's a son of Curlin, so you know he's going to stretch out. Uh, and yet, at, at, you know, at six furlongs in the best pal, he's, Zoe was just absolutely dominating. The 60th graded stakes winner for Curlin. That's quite incredible. And he did dominate. He was supposed to dominate. Um, I was at the sale, so I, I just saw the race in the distance. Was there an inquiry or any kind of objection in the race? Because it no. looked like Mischief, and there should have been, because Mischief River looked like he came over on the Philly White Sands. And that's a Philly against the boys, and greatest stakes placing means a lot, especially if you own a Philly. I think there should have been at least something posted or looked at. Am I the only one that thinks that? I guess so. I, no way. I mean, there was some, there was some, con there was definitely some contact there. There was, I mean, there's no doubt about it yeah. that, that he, that he came over on the Philly and, and, you know, bothered her to a certain extent. I, mean, I guess the stewards have to decide, was it enough to impact the placing? She finished third, so she still graded stakes placed, but 
Right. Second would second would have been better. Yeah. Okay. Well, if Bob Baffert dominates the two-year-old races at Saratoga, you would, excuse me, at, at Del Mar, who's going to dominate at Saratoga? Well, who else but Todd Pletcher? Saratoga special was run on that awful rainy Saturday at Saratoga. And Randy, I have a question for you. Um, this is because of the figures. Um, I, I would guess that making figures for two-year-old races must, it must be the, about the hardest thing you guys have to do. Um, showcase trained by Todd Pletcher, ridden by Irod Ortiz, cost 300000 First time out, won a main race by seven and a half lengths. The horse is supposed to be off those credentials, three to five, but then only ran a 58 buyer figure. You know, how do you personally as a handicapper deal with that? Um, I, I tend to really downplay the two-year-old numbers. Um, it, it just depends. It depends on... Uh I don't want to get too deep in the speed figure weeds here, but since we've got a pretty um, intelligent horse racing uh, clientele here, I'll, I'll I'll do that to a certain extent. The the issue with Showcase was that in his career debut, he ran on July the 6th at the Belmont at Aqueduct meeting, and he ran on a day that was uh, fairly consistent uh, from – after his race on to the end of the card in terms of how fast the racetrack seemed to be, okay? And if you apply that speed of the racetrack, the dirt surface that day, based on all the other races, and you apply it to Showcase's race, you get a 58 buyer speed figure, which is what our speed figure maker in New York stuck with, right? That's the data. That's what the data says. It was the first race on the card, so occasionally, you can't count on this, but occasionally you get situations where maybe they didn't put as much water on the racetrack for the first race on the card, and they saw that it was really cuppy afterward, and then they start pouring the water on. Um, maybe the last, if it was the last race on the card, sometimes the racetrack, it, you know, when the sun goes down, it retains moisture better, and the track's a little faster. You know, there are a lot of little nuances that go into it. but. You would think that a horse that won that impressively visually would have to get a better speed figure than a 58. When I saw that, first thing I did was go into our database. That can't possibly be right. And I looked at it, and based on the data, that's what it was. Now, in hindsight, this horse comes back, and uh, and he wins very impressively in the Saratoga Special. Now that number, based on evidence, has been changed. So the next time Showcase runs... The career debut won't show a 58. It'll show a 73, which is admittedly a guess because you've got one race to go on, right? I mean, you just have to guess what you think that figure should have been. But that's that's part of the challenge in uh, in making speed figures. And not just with two-year-olds. It's just in general. Sometimes the racetrack surface can get a little funky. Um, I think he's a superstar. The way he ran, the way Arad tried to bully his way through there, couldn't get through. Pratt's not letting him out. Dives down to the inside. He learned so much and showed so much moxie in the running of that race. Took some dirt. Did everything you want to see from a really good horse. 300000 at Keelan looks like a steal right now. The TD and Riders Room also brought to you by the PHBA, the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Let me give you some Pennsylvania bred math that will be very important, I think, to horse owners. First of all, if you're if you have a PA bred and you win a fifty thousand dollar maiden special weight race in Parks Parks Racing in Pennsylvania, the owner takes home forty two thousand dollars. The purse is fifty. The owner takes home forty two thousand because that's the purse plus the owner's bonus. At any other track, it'd be like running for a purse of seventy thousand dollars. If you're the owner and the breeder, then you take home either fifty thousand four hundred dollars. That's for a non-PA sired horse or 58.8 for a Pennsylvania sired horse. That's almost like that's that is like running for a purse of one hundred thousand dollars. So don't miss out on this. You can breed and or race in Pennsylvania. Capitalize on all this. For more information, you can contact the PA Bread uh, office at info at pabread.com or call 610-444-1050. 
The PA Horse Breeders Association presents the new and improved Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Six $100,000 stakes for PA sired PA breads and parks. Two six furlong contests on PA Derby Day. The two year olds then go seven furlongs on December 30th. The last two races are in August 2025 for three year olds. Then 50,000 in breeder bonuses go to the top three horses in the series. For more, go to pabread.com. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breds, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. The TAD and Riders Room brought to you by Kentucky Breds. We're always stressing the point that Kentucky Breds win, not just in the U.S. and North America, but all over the world. And that was certainly the case at the recent glorious Goodwood meeting in the U.K. Black Forza, who sold at Keeneland November as a, as a weanling, and then phasing tipped in July as a yearling, won the Group 2 Richmond Stakes at Goodwood. Uh, the two-year-old Black Forza is a son of complexity. And then at the same meeting, the three-year-old Philly opera singer, how good is she, by Justify, won the Group 1 Nassau Stakes. Those are uh, they're the two Kentucky-bred Justifies coming up now in that uh, Arcana sale that we just talked to Emma about. Uh, both were purchased at Weanlings in Keeneland, November. So coming up this weekend, we have the Alabama at Saratoga, the Grade 1 Delmar Oaks at Delmar. Uh, and the Alabama is obviously the key race this weekend at Saratoga. Um, but you know something? Thorpedo Anna's not in it. Uh, she's not supposed to be in it. She should be in the Travers. But just taking her out of there, it's kind of a blah race, I'd have to say. I guess Candied, uh, who ran second behind Thorpedo Anna in the coaching club, would be a pretty solid favorite for Todd Pletcher and uh, Manny Franco. But, um, you know, this is one of those races where I'm glad they're going with the superstar in the Travers. It'll make for a great Travers. But again, this is in Alabama that uh, just doesn't do a whole lot for you so far as looking for future stars or horses that have already uh uh, counting themselves as stars. Uh, someone will come out of it, but we'll see. Are you looking at the perspective field right now? Yes, how, I am. How big is the perspective field? One, two, three, four. Well, it's not perspective. They've drawn the race. Oh, and how many? Eight, eight horses. Okay. Okay. So you have eight horses in the Alabama and it's going to be a pretty good betting race. I would think if Torpedo Anna had run in the Alabama, what would you have had? Three, three, four? Eight. <laughs> Probably yeah, you know, win, one to nine. Yeah. Win betting only, maybe. I, I don't know how they would have handled that at, at Naira. But, uh, you know, no, it's not as uh, sexy a race without Torpedo Anna. But I think from a betting perspective, I think it's going to be much better with her running in the Travers than with her at one to nine mm -hmm. in the Alabama, my opinion. I'm with you, Randy. It's going to be a very, very good betting race. And, you know, perhaps Candy, you know, she didn't get a chance to run. Um, what am I talking about? She didn't get a chance to run, but she needs another grade one. And she's not going to get it running against Torpedo Anna. So she's likely going to go off the favor. But there are several other horses in here that deserve consideration. you got Miss Justify, who just took down the Wilson Stakes in her last start. America's Vow just basking. Not a great race, but it will be a good betting race. Um, if you're wondering what the noise is, I did try and move. But I'm in the treehouse at Saratoga above the paddock, and we're now mowing grass. <laughs> so, but look around. If you look right behind me, can you see your favorite horse on the big board? Do no, you know who, who that would is? that be? No, She's I been can't there see. The whole meet, it's a dare manner. Ah, oh, no. there you go. I see. Yeah. I missed last week's podcast when the conversation was about a dare man, or yeah. at least partially. So, so yeah, I, I just now. I'm sorry, I was behind the curve here on the field actually being drawn for the Alabama. But you've got Intricate, who's beaten eight and a half lengths by Torpedo Anna in the Coaching Club Oaks. You've got Power Squeeze, who was beaten almost seven lengths by Torpedo Anna in the Acorn. Um, you know, you've got uh, Candy, who was beaten four and a half. 
in the coaching club American Oaks, it's very possible you wouldn't have gotten any of those to come back and run against Torpedo Anna if she was entered in the Alabama. So there's that. Out west at Del Mar, there is the Del Mar Oaks. Zoe, you are our Del Mar expert. Take it away. I haven't seen PPs or anything like that. So you uh, you tell us what's going on. Well, I was hoping that Phil Bauer could help us out a little bit more. He's got Buku in there, uh, who he mentioned looks like she could bounce back in there. We're filming this on Monday. I have the probables in front of me. Buku, who's a definite whiskey decision for Delacour. A Maduro for Urton, who had that three, four race winning streak snapped. And then it looks like a few from Phil D'Amato. Ice cream, you scream. We all scream for ice cream. She'll be the top one in there for him. Zona Verde and Circle of Trust. So not an overly huge field as far as I can see going forward. But I did like what Phil Bauer had to say about Buku and the pace setting up for her. And it looks like the mower's back, Zoe. <laughs> I know. Okay. <laughs> it's right to move. So, Zoe, we'll stay with you because um, not only you are, you are a Del Mar expert, you are a sales expert. And um, you heard Emma Berry talk about it earlier in the podcast that the Europeans were very uh, pleased by how well the sale went, uh, the Saratoga phase of Tipton sale, thinking that the same thing is going to happen in Arcana. Uh, just what were some of the highlights and what were some of your observations? It was an incredible sale with some incredible horses. Uh, it's not quite over yet. We've got the New York Fazit Tipton sale going on. They had that night session last night and they just started selling today. So that's still going on. But the actual Saratoga Select broke all records, right? 154 yearlings sold, good for $82 million. That's up 9.5% on last year's handle, the median, just think about this, 425,000 was the median. So they're making money left, oh, left over right, to be honest. The, the sale topper, again, Amazadan, much like last year, buying the sale topper for 3.4 million. Speedway Stables, uh, I helped Marette Farrell. They picked up a, a very nice uh, colt from Lane's End, from the family, the White God family bred this horse. So it, in total, it was a massive sale all round, helped by multi-million dollar horses. It is time for the XB TV work of the week, and this one's for you, Randy. Senor Buscador worked a half mile at Del Mar on August the 8th in 47 and 1. Good time for him. He's not always the most generous workhorse. That's him there on the outside with his workmate, Red Pill, Inside of him, Joe Talamo up aboard Senor Buscador. Now, we've not seen him since finishing third in the Dubai World Cup in March. He won the Saudi Cup prior to that, and he's now pointing for the Pat O'Brien Stakes on August the, 24th, August the 24th at Del Mar. You planning on headed out there, Randy? You like Del Mar. You love Senor Buscador. I would love nothing more than to be out of Del Mar on a nice 78 degree day with a boogie board in the morning, going out on Del Mar Beach and hitting the waves and then going to the track in the afternoon. Unfortunately, I won't be at Del Mar until the Breeders' Cup in November when the water is going to be too cold to get into. Be a smarter, better with XB TV, the best horses. With thousands of exclusive morning workouts. all at your fingertips and delivered right into your inbox everything you need to be informed be smart bet smart with xb tv all the thrills fraction of the bills experience the power of the partnership Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. 
Lucy and I would like to tell you that the TD and Riders Room is also brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Isn't that right? It was an emotional victory for West Point Thoroughbreds. We've already talked about the Saratoga Derby on Sunday. Uh, West Point's Terry Finley, very good friends with Wade Yost, the father of Carson Yost. And we've talked about that story in the past and, uh, and how much it means to the West Point people. Carson Yost was born with the same very rare genetic disorder, Wolf's, Wolf Hirschhorn Syndrome as was Cody Dorman, the late namesake of the tremendous racehorse Cody's Wish. So we've been following Carson's run for a long time. He's been very successful. Obviously, he'd already won the grade one summer stakes last year at Woodbine, and he got the job done in the Saratoga Derby uh, to essentially reward trainer Christophe Clement for his hunch that Carson's run would appreciate more distance, and clearly he did. Isn't that right? So now West Point and uh, Clement, We'll have a newcomer from France to look forward to, Le Ray. Le Ray's runs on Saturday in the grade two Lake Placid Stakes for three-year-old fillies. I'm, I'm not French. Le Ray's. Let's get that right. <laughs> to learn more, visit westpointtv.com. Le Ray's. So that's a wrap on this week's show. I want to thank everybody for tuning us in. I especially want to thank my partners, Randy Moss and Zoe Cadman, our Green Group guests of the week, Phil Bauer, and the people who work for us behind the scenes, our producers, Katie Petruniak, Anthony LaRocca, and Aliyah LaRocca. That's it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room Podcast. Catch up with you next week. Mm-hmm.